Hello and welcome to Ditch Fin Vox, Voices in Digital Finance. I'm your host, James DiBiazio. If you enjoy the content, please give us a like, subscribe, let the algorithm know. My guest today is Ned Phillips, co-founder and CEO of Singapore-based wealth tech Bamboo. Ned and I had a freewheeling discussion about the state of robo-advisory and whether it's really moving the needle in terms of how consumers invest for the long term. Ned Phillips from Bamboo, welcome to Ditch Finvox. James, how are you doing? It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, it's not so easy for me to get down to Singapore these days, but I'm sure we'll correct that in the near future. I did see you know because we did. Uh, I think it was maybe six six months ago. I saw you in Singapore. I know you kind of ventured down to make it happen. I you know I have deep love for Hong Kong. I know traveling out of Hong Kong is not the easiest, but I I did notice that they said they might be scrapping quarantine. So hopefully we'll see you soon. Where where everyone's got their fingers crossed. But um, in the meantime, uh, you have been involved uh, in the weeds of wealth tech uh, and digital solutions in wealth for consumers and banks for quite a while now. Um, I'd love to get your perspective, uh, your own perspective, as well as, I guess, from your seat as a co-founder of Bamboo, uh, in terms of where are we right now? What is the state of wealth tech uh, that, that you see? Is there a way to describe that? Yeah, you know, and I, and, and I posted something on LinkedIn last week, Monday, I, and I, I, I don't know if this summarizes it correctly, but it gave it was my view sort of just a week ago, and it stands it stands in terms of how I think about it. In Dallas, one of the B two C uh, robo advisors out of Singapore put on a conference, and it was a far four hour Monday afternoon wealth tech conference. Now, the thing that struck me wasn't just that it was a good conference and it was live again and all of that stuff. It was that Goldman's and UBS and BlackRock and Mundi and Dimensional all queued up to sponsor it. And yeah. I'm like, wow, look at this. As I mentioned, in my, I wrote in my LinkedIn post, you know, when I started Bamboo five years ago, I was lucky to get an invite to one of these big, you know, financial legacy firms, so, you know, conferences. And now they're almost queuing up. And I even heard a couple of uh, legacy financial players in the corridor outside, one guy scolding another guy. Hey, why, why weren't we sponsoring this event? <laughs> so... Now, I, I know one event doesn't make an industry, but I think the note is this, even though AUM is small, like I'm not, I'm still realistic, you know, digital yeah. wealth is still small. I think there's an undeniable uh, momentum with it now that I think, you know, Dow's just announced 2 billion, which is you know, very small in AUM. But I think what we're seeing from both B2C and B2B is that everybody wants to be a player in some way. The economics of it, that's up, that's up for discussion, Jake. So yeah. how does it play out economically? But I think the momentum in digital wealth, which has been there for the last few years, is pretty undeniable now. And yeah, happy to discuss how that breaks down in B2B and B2C, but it's clear that all the large financial players are committed to it. The first big note, I think it was last year when Stashaway said they had hit uh, a billion. That was probably the one that got people's attention as well. I, I agree, you know, and... Uh, I know McKaylee well, and I remember right at the early, and I hope McKaylee doesn't mind me saying this story, uh, right at the early days of Stashaway, because I'd built exchanges before. And when you build a new stock exchange, people ask, oh, how, what's your turnover? And if you right. don't say a number, and again, James, you're in the industry, if a company doesn't say how much it's got, you assume it's zero, right? <laughs> like, so, but you can't say a number that's small, because if you say a small number, people... And I sat with McKaylee maybe five years ago and he was, what well, he did not tell me where they were at. He's like, Ned, what do you think is the number before we should say the number? I remember thinking in my head, a hundred million would be pretty good five years ago. But when Stashaway announced a billion, I was like, now, now, now you're talking. Yeah. Is a billion going to disrupt the trillions in AUM and BlackRock has what, eight trillion or whatever it is? No. But it's significant. I agree. I do think these billions, two billions, what's the number to be profitable? I think it's closer to 10 to 15 billion. So a long way to go. But I, I agree. I think people were like, oh, OK, this is the thing. The difference is, I mean, we can talk about the profitability model, but you provide digital solutions for the banks themselves. They've got this captive deposit base um, and you help them you know, create better products and better ways to engage and, and get fees. Um, when they look at 
an Adawas or a stash away and they see that kind of growth. We also have some um, some robos in, in Hong Kong. I'm not quite sure how well they're doing, but hopefully some positive shoots. They are, what, what are they thinking about? Are they thinking, well, I've got my, you know, I've got Ned here or one of your competitors um, build, building this and we will, you know, we will have the same thing. Uh, or are they looking at that saying they're building this on a completely cloud-based, uh, you know, super low cost, nimble tech? Um, you know, are they worried about it, or are they just saying, "Well, I got Ned here, so we're we're in the we're in the same place, and I've got my Robo solution, so we're done." It's a cool question. Um, they are are they worried about it? Yes. The reason I know is every time a stashware in Dallas announces a new number, one or two billion. Or in Singapore, I see Stashaway plastered or in Dallas plastered on buses and siphon. I love it because I take photos and I, I know the founders of these firms. I'm like, yay, thank you for doing that. Because every time a Stashaway in Dallas or a Scythe goes past a barrier, puts an ad out, the legacy firms, even though their AUM is small, are like, we need to have that. And do I get calls? To, am I a net beneficiary of that? Yes, I am. Yeah. Now, I would say three or four years ago, you know, I think a lot of the financial players were like, oh, I'll build it myself, right? It's easy. But look at today, and Dallas has more than 200 people. Stashaway has like 180. So I kind of say to banks, look, if you want to build it yourself, that's totally fine. Go and hire 180 people who know how to build Robo and give it three years, and then you'll have your own Robo. And I know that's a little cynical or sarcastic, but that's the reality. And so what percentage buy, build, or partner? I, you know, I don't have the exact number. Obviously, some buy. Well, we saw UBS and Wealthfront come and go. But there's, you know, personal capital. And, you know, there's been a lot of people who have brought. We have seen, so just to give you an idea, while I can't name them all, we have five robos going live in Q4, Jane. Right. And we've never seen a busier period. And I think it's not just, you know, in Dubai, in many markets, they have their own stash of ways of the Dallas is, and they're mm. growing. And I think they're starting, they, meaning the banks or the asset managers, are starting to realize they can't build it themselves. They're not tech firm. You know, sure, they understand what agile is or APIs are, but there's a lot to building robo-advisory. The, the pipes inside, how to split an ETF into multiple goals, how to do fractional ETF and mutual fund trading. So, yeah. And the, and the fees as well, right? Figure out how to get paid. Well, that's, James, it's a good thing. It's a good, good question because I think for the longest time, wealth management's been like a massively bloated industry. You know, people could charge whatever. You know, in some countries, they're still charging 3% entry, 1% annual, 1% exit. I mean, you know, you're 500 basis points just to get in and out. It's madness, right? So- no, but I meant the, the technology of figuring out how to move the fees around from a purely digital process is not straightforward. It's not straightforward. No, it is not. And, you know, look, that some of them, what they try to do is just put on a website what they're doing with paperwork, right? So they'll just, you know, launch a website where you can docu-sign something, but it's not straightforward. And the cus they lose a lot of customers in that journey. Yeah, like I think it's not just a question of digitizing. It's a question of digitizing so customers will stay with you and stick with you because like in all areas of FinTech, Jamie, and you've written about it, customers can move way easier than they used to. Before, if you had a financial advisor, you just weren't moving. Or if you had your wealth, you just weren't moving. With wealth tech today, I honestly think institutions are not only worried, they're realistic, they're understanding, we've got to do something. And I think they realize that building themselves is not the right thing. What's going to be the long-term advantage of the institutions? Um, obviously, they've got brand, they've got marketing. Um, but in terms of the actual the investment itself, the pure financial aspect of this is fairly commoditized now. Uh, how, how do you see over time these banks being able to, you know, stay ahead or at least, you know, uh, maintain a, 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 a good level of profitability? Yeah, maybe I, maybe I don't see that. <laughs> maybe right. I don't see that they do because, you know, look, when we were kids, James, and I don't, maybe I'm a little older than you, but we're both, we're not millennials, or I hope you're not because you're, uh, you've been around too long to be a millennial. Okay. Um, you know, you trusted your bank. You went to, you know, a Citibank or a Wells or a DBS or an HSBC. And, you know, if they knew, well, there wasn't apps around, but if somebody just launched a new bank, you wouldn't use it. But today, you know, you can launch a stash where an endowment. So, for example, Trust Bank, I know it's from Standard Chartered, but they got 100,000 customers in the first week, right? How do they monetize it, et cetera? 
I, I, I don't know how a bank stays relevant and profitable. I actually think maybe they become more of the pipes, more of the distributors. Maybe asset managers are just product providers. You know, and it's a very, it's a very challenging, I'm not going to say game, but process. Let's say you're a bank in wealth. You know, for many years, you've had trust. You've had monopoly or oligopoly. There's only a few of you in each market. Now you're getting attacked and these new apps are cool and trendy and different. And, you know, some of them might be pushing regulations a little bit and banks clearly are not going to. I, I, I don't have a good answer. I think they have to. I often say this when I pitch a bank. Why are you building a robot? And they're like, oh, I've, and there's maybe three answers. We've been told by management we have to, mm -hmm. which is the one I like the least because they won't stick with it. Um, we don't want to lose customers and we understand that we're probably going to lose money in the short term on it. That's the one I like the most because they're realistic. It's a long term and we're building a robot to make money. It's not a short term money game. So I actually think how they stay is that, and I would love to be a fly on the wall with the UBS wealth front thing. Why did they ditch it? Was it because they realized that the half a million customers that wealth front had may not become UBS customers because you want to move them up the funnel, right? Take a 20 yeah. year view, get people early, give them a great service, move them up the funnel. And then when they're retiring with their, you know, half a million, billion dollars or whatever, you're making money. But I think they stay relevant by taking a long-term view. If it's short-term, I think they just lose a truckload of money, Jane, to be honest. We've seen over the past few years, some of the big asset managers acquire or take partnerships in robos, um, Few of the top made. I mean, Franklin Templeton, Schroeder's, um, Standard. Uh, there's there's a bunch of them. Uh, what's your take on that experience? Don't need you to call out anybody, but is it working when a big traditional asset manager uh, tries to acquire or onboard a, a a group that came out of the a pure robo business? The reason, and I'll answer the first part of the question: Why are they doing it? because I think asset managers just become producers of product, right? And those fees are going to get crushed and crushed and crushed and crushed. So they have to, and they typically were given those products to advisors, private banks, financial advisors, to distributors. And now they're saying, wow, right? We need to be distributors ourselves. So go direct to market. And many asset managers are not direct to market. So I, I, I think the experience of working with them is a bit like my answer to your previous question. If they're committed to understand, this is not just a three year, five year, let's have a go at Robo, see if it works. It doesn't. In, in, if you're just putting it out there as more of a proof of concept, we'll see what happens. I think the reality is for asset managers, they're going to be distributing direct to market over time, right? Yeah. And I think they buy a Robo to say, look, we don't know how to do that. They've, for most of them, they've never distributed direct to market. Yeah. And so look, I think some of them have worked, some of them have not, but I think some of them have worked. And I, I think it's the ones, again, robo is not the quick fix, but it is the long-term answer. It truly, really, I think is the long-term answer because, you know, may, and again, look, there's been a local firm, I won't call it out by name, here in Singapore that's been smart. It's kind of partnered with, you know, some of the wallets and the telcos and, mm -hmm. you know, the people, you know, the, the, the people who have mass distribution. We're actually building for someone in Asia who's got a kind of more of a wallet, experience so we're building for them and they partner with an asset manager and the asset manager knows that they're only going to be selling very small bits each time yeah but it gets those customers yes it might be loss making but long term so i think it works if the asset manager goes into it with the right long-term concept and i would say overall half have worked and half haven't what's been the evolution of the product itself uh people like to throw around oh we're on robo 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever so i've got a buzzword um but, you know, essentially in, in the early days uh, when you started at Bamboo, these things were really just, um, you know, we'll, we'll get you to select um, three different buckets uh, and they all invest in ETFs. Um, where, where are we at with it now? How sophisticated can you get? I maybe shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Still the same. Still the because same. That, that's all you need, right? Retirement savings it should be boring. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the great quote, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, if your retirement plan isn't boring, you're doing it wrong. Right. You know, in essence, what you should do is get, you know, either a little bit in, you know, conservative, a little bit in moderate, a little bit of us. So I don't think it's so in terms of the pure robot, I don't think it's James. Not it's James. I think 
I don't think investing has changed over the years, right? You know, the 60, 40, 80, 20, you know, I'm 55, so I should have 55% in bonds and 45% in equity, right? And you change over time. And whether it's ETF or mutual funds, I actually think the debate around robo has always been a bit weird. I get asked still, Jane, today, hey, how does your robo beat the market? I'm like, dudes, if I had a robo that beat the market, I'd be running ahead of my yacht. <laughs> what do you like? I think the word robo advisor conjures up this algorithmic driven idea. It's a person with a spreadsheet, like a fund manager, building buckets of funds and delivering it on a mobile phone. Now, so I think Robo 1.0 is still 95% of the market. What has changed? We, what we've really seen is digital banks, forward thinking legacy banks saying to customers, hey, here's how digital wealth should work. We're looking at what balance you've got left over every month. We're using data to drive, you know, understand who you are. You're 28, first job. We can see you just got married, so you're likely to have a kid. You know, you need to buy a house. We can start to kind of, you know, create these goals for you. We're using data because, you know, Jane, you're an experienced financial professional. Do you know the exact number you need for retirement? Um, I can guess, but it's, it's, uh, my, my wife's number is bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you see, look, it's, you know, the idea that we still ask people, if I said to you, what's your risk level? One out of 10, I'm sure you could get it vaguely, right? But you're guessing and you're a professional. The idea that a robo is driven by an individual's capacity to correctly estimate their own outcomes actually doesn't make sense. We suck at so I think the thing that has changed in Robo 2.0 is data is being used correctly to help people get their goals. How does this then fit into this theme around embedded finance, data sharing, which and a lot of the consumer apps or the aggregators often go down, boil down to life goals and these sorts of things. Um, and they always sound kind of interesting, but I'm not sure in reality that they pan out. Um, but let's just talk about that data sharing open banking model. Uh, what, what's the role of Robo today in that? I'm, 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 I'm going to, I think, the, so is open sharing of data important to Robo? Yes. Here's the problem. How many Robos, I'm not picking on anybody, but please give me a shout and hit me up on LinkedIn if you're one of these Robos. How many Robos mark themselves out of did your client achieve their goal? You're getting paid on AUM and you call it a house goal. But did they buy the house? Do you care? You don't care, right? I think there's still this, what's the right word? I don't want to use a negative word. I'm going to use a weird, I'm going to say, there's still this kind of dislocation whereby, mm -hmm. oh, I beat the market. Yeah, but you said you were going to buy the house and you didn't buy the house. Why? Oh, because you didn't save. Now, if you share data correctly, what's coming in, what's going out, I think that's really important. And I think it's crucial. Again, I've used this phrase many times. Nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, hey, I'd like to buy a balanced equity portfolio today. You're just done, right? It's not how your brain works. Nobody actually wants a mutual fund. Like you don't want a mutual fund, right? You want to achieve your goals. Yet robos are rarely marked or rarely uh, uh, driven or motivated or commercially realized on did your customer achieve their goal? And I think I'm starting to see robos not doing that because they're still getting paid on AUM, but starting to implement that and kind of, hey, What's the likelihood of achieving your goal? And I think if we look five, 10 years down the line, you know, Carlsberg, probably the best beer in the world. Google, probably the best wealth manager in the world. Google knows how much you need to retire. Google knows how much you need. If we all shared all our data freely, we'd be so much better off financially in wealth because it would stop us making stupid decisions and they could crunch all the data and tell you, hey, look, you got to start saving today. So, yeah. But from a commercial point of view, it's difficult to do that for, say, buy a house or put your child through university or whatever or retire because these are such long-term i don't want to say abstract they're very real to people but you, you you know it requires such a commitment over time to reach those goals that if, if as a business you're rewarding yourself like oh my customer got the business therefore i get some sort of reward for helping them that would be very difficult to implement maybe for short-term things it could be better what, what do you think ah uh. I may respectfully disagree because these are the most important things. And I think, you see, the, the number one criteria for achieving your goal is not the performance of your mutual fund. It's your, uh, your behavior in saving every month what you said you were going to save. That's the biggest predictor of achieving your goals is your monthly uh, uh, ability to invest what, or save what you said. 
And while I, I hear you on short term, but on long term, I think, you know, nobody likes financial education. Who wants to sit down and have an hour lectured about budgeting? Nobody does. But who wants to achieve their goals? Everybody does. So actually, James, I think there is a market out there for better behavior. Look, the industry, I'm not going to pick on buy now, pay later, but it should be save now, buy later. It shouldn't be yeah. buy now, pay later. Right. It should yeah. be save now. But who, who wants that? Nobody wants it. So I actually... I actually think it could work. Is that, would that require a very different approach to the fees and the way that the business model operates? Because it sounds like instead of moving from AUM, you'd have to move to something that sounds more like insurance. Mm, yeah, but then again, do people get, yeah, an annuity maybe, but think about it this way, right? If you were the robo that helped most people achieve their goal. So which robo do you pick? The robo that most people achieve their goals or the robo that beat the market? But be the market's abstract. No, no, no one really cares, right? Unless you boast to your friends that you brought GameStop low and sold it high, you know, whoop-de-do. But the reality is now, how would you commercialize it? I would pay. Think of James, it's a bit like financial advice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, financial advice is broken as well because you don't get a refund on your fees if, the, if you don't achieve your goal, right? So I think the whole industry, I think there is a commercial way because I think if you achieve your goal and you're on track for your goal, you could charge. It's almost like a life coach, right? A wealth coach should get paid on results, right? I don't know if life coaches get paid on results. No idea, but I don't either. I, I do think there is a way to do it. Would it mean a radical change of the wealth industry? Yes. But let's let's all be honest here. The wealth industry is not, has never been commercially skewed towards the consumer. It's always been a product selling, advice-led industry, which is changing for the better now. So I actually I think customers would pay on success of achieving their goal i would yeah okay well let's think about that and um <clears throat> see what some of the banks say and some of the asset managers say about uh, the viability there um one last area is do you get as a category do you get confused with say the mobile brokers the um the robin hoods or the etoros of the world um the gamification Let's put it that way. Products that probably gamify things versus the boringness of saving for retirement. It's a great question in that what we've re the reason that Robo has way less AUM. So, James, you've and I don't know if you've written the articles, but you've seen the articles. Did Robo fulfill its promise? Right. And generally, the answer is no. Why? Because it's boring. Right. You know, mm -hmm. we live in a world of instant gratification. Now, I don't know if you've traded on Robin Hood or any of these, but little confetti comes down and you swipe up and you're a hero. And of course, I don't know if confetti comes down when you lose 50%. I assume something else comes down, but I, I don't know what it is, right? But the problem is, is that we're saving for retirement is dull and boring. And I don't think they should be confused. We don't get confused for it, you know? Like, like but, but there is a crossover, right? Like, we worked on a product where it had a little button that said, trade now, invest now. You know, they've got to be different. And, you know, COVID, crypto, the whole, you know, period where I think it was beautifully written by somebody who was like, you know, we we gamified the stock market, locked people up and gave them free money. What do you think was going to happen, right? Like, and, and the stock market only went up, right? Like, what do you think? And I actually think it's to detriment of robo because Robo looks even more boring now, right? And you know what you'll see? I've seen more and more. Robo's offering crypto. Robo's offering, you know, you can buy GameStop. Like, is that, I don't want to get into it, Jay, because I'm going to get all the old and cynical here. I think a lot of Robo's kind of went down the road. Hey, well, look, people want to buy and sell stocks of crypto. That's fine. Like, I'm not against that. But don't call yourself a robo anymore, right? That you're not you're not helping you're not helping people save for the future. I don't mind people having a little bit of crypto in their in their diversification. So I don't. Uh, while I think you know, in general, people might regard them as similar. I think they're incredibly different, and I think it's much harder to gamify something that is designed to be boring. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, last question uh, for you, Ned. Let's just uh, we're in Asia, so let's look at the Asian landscape traditionally uh funds have been sold through banks that's the distribution that's a basic distribution model for for most markets here uh still is the case that's why you've got a job um 
What do you think this will look like in a couple of years from now? Let's say three years from now. Uh, will this relationship be un essentially unchanged, just looks different? Uh, or will there be, a, do you see a real shakeup in the way that people uh, buy or access uh, medium to long-term investments? I don't see a big change in, in that time frame, James, no. I think banks still hold the, the huge advantage. They have customers, they can distribute, they're getting better at you know making their services you know more digital or technological technological and, and easy to access for customers and I think they still win. I mean look look in Singapore and again I love in Dallas I love Stash I love you guys you're doing amazing but it's maybe five billion between them Cypher and everything you know like that, that in the big world of AUM it's it's small will it grow massively I think they'll do great I really do and I think they are scaring the banks. I think the banks will still have 95, 98, 99% of all fund sales, you know, uh, in the market. If you're saying 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. then I think there's a much bigger change coming in. And my bet is that the, not the super apps, but I, I think the Googles, I don't know about the TikToks, but I think these places where funds can, or, or companies, like I found out the other day that TikTok has a billion active users and they can do whatever they like, right? Like yeah. it, you know? And I think young people are very happy to get financial advice from a video, uh, from a video streaming services, and then you can click and buy. And I think that will fundamentally change. But I think for the next three to five years, banks still hold the, the, the strong hand for sure. Okay. Ned, it's been a pleasure to have you on Digfin Vox. Thanks for your time today. Always. Thanks, James. Good to see you.